that is not pasteurized, that is not boiled, you are at risk of contracting the disease. It can also be found in meat, like I talked about the case we have in the abattoir. Yes. If the veterinary staff are not there to condemn, most times the butchers quickly hide it and sell the meat out. And if it is found in the lungs, usually the size of the lungs becomes very big and large. You understand? Yes. So they sell it to others that are not aware and they will buy it and prepare it and sell to humans that will consume it without knowing. And through that means, humans also get infected. Then the butchers too, working in the abattoir, if they have wounds on their hands, do you understand? In the process of uh, working on the cattle that has it, that's on the carcass that has TB, and they have wounds and perforations, they can also get infected. So, and when they do, the disease when humans are affected, it, it, it presents symptoms and signs typical of the normal TB found in, uh, in humans caused by mycobacterium tuberculosis. But the challenge we have about this one is that the disease is under diagnosis. One of the drugs that they use in treating TB in humans, that is parapirazinamide. So it's resistant to it. And because of that, you will see that the human patient may not be responding favorably to the TB treatment. And most times they can refer the person as having drug-resistant TB. Meanwhile, it may not be drug-resistant TB. So that is the challenge we have about the TB in cattle or in animals. Okay, that's a good background there from your point of view. Okay, let me come back to you, Dr. Anza. What are the common types of, uh, especially drawing from the insights we have shared from your co-discussant on the program, Dr. Agada, the one that is obtainable in animals? Okay, thank you very much for the question. When you talk about um, types of um, tuberculosis, we, we are looking at, um, we can classify them into, depending on the site where the disease condition is found. She already mentioned um, pulmonary tuberculosis, PTB, which means that the disease is affecting the lungs. That's the one people are usually uh, more familiar with. It presents with coughing, person somebody's coughing for a very long time we usually will look at any cough lasting longer than two weeks to be evaluated for for pulmonary tuberculosis the individual may be coughing and producing blood the cough cough the sputum that produces blood stain mixed with blood you know this is uh, this in addition to other symptoms of tuberculosis uh, it points to pulmonary tuberculosis ptb then tuberculosis can affect Almost any organ in the body. Uh, she mentioned the TB abdomen affecting the um, organs that are there in the abdominal cavity. This uh, tuberculosis can affect the the brain. We have TB meningitis. It can affect also the spine. Uh, you know, so it can affect the kidneys. It can affect the body. When the tuberculosis affects the the lungs, we call it pulmonary tuberculosis. When it affects other parts of the body, exclusive of the lungs, it's called extra pulmonary tuberculosis, extra pulmonary, outside the, um, the lungs. So depending on the site of infection, it can be classified that way. Then um, in the, the course of treatment, tuberculosis, some cases can become resistant to treatment. There are cases that can become resistant to treatment 
And uh, she also uh, mentioned that she talked about um, multi-drug resistant tuberculosis. Yes. Yes. There is uh, the medications that are used for the treatment of tuberculosis are classified into the first line and second line agents, first line and second line drug. So the for at uh, the first contact, most cases are treated with a combination of these first line um, drugs. If the individual is found not to demonstrate commensurate improvement, then the person is evaluated for resistance because they, are, they, they can be resistant to some of the medications that are part of the um, first line uh, medications. So depending on whether there is resistance or not, we can also classify tuberculosis as um, drug resistant. It can be um, drug, multi-drug resistant or non-drug resistant tuberculosis. So when you talk about types, those are the, uh, the, the types that I can think of at the moment. Okay. Dr. Okada, is there something you would like to add to this, especially with regards to the common types of TB, not just in humans, also in animals? Sorry, she has um, mentioned all. Like in animals, mainly we have two types, the pulmonary and the extra pulmonary. So it depends on which organ the organism is affected. So the most in the veterinary profession, we have just two broad classifications. He has ex and discussed extensively of those found in humans. So I don't have much to add to it. Oh, okay, fine. So, uh, Dr. Anza, let me come back to you now. Looking at the situation of TB and the, the, the commemoration of the day this year, the theme is tied to, yes, we can end TB. Drawing from this team, to what extent are people aware of the devastating impact of TB? The general awareness about TB? Well, um, we can say, um, uh, maybe talking um, in general terms, that uh, there appears to be some degree of awareness, but uh, not adequate. Not ad there's not adequate awareness about uh, tuberculosis um, in terms of uh, its causes, in terms of uh, the risk factors for its transmission, uh, in terms of, uh, um, of uh, prevention measures that individuals can employ at the community level, even in terms of um, areas where, you know, sites where individuals can, who, who have symptoms that are similar or that could be tuberculosis can go to obtain, to obtain care. Uh, I was reading a couple of days back and uh, I was surprised to well, I shouldn't have been surprised, but I was surprised to learn that uh, people still consider tuberculosis to be, um, uh, um, you know, the result of witchcraft, attacks, spells, and all of those kind of things to, to, to result from um, supernatural um, uh, uh, acts of wickedness, uh, not from the macrobacterium, um, you know, organism that we have just talked about. So there appears to be still um, a, a large reservoir of ignorance as far as um, the tuberculosis uh, tuberculosis is concerned, and I think that's also that's partly because it has it has been a, a around for a long time. It's quite, probably one of the oldest uh, uh, disease conditions, you know. It's been around for a long time, and the programs for uh, the intervention program. You know, we have a national um, tuberculosis and leprosy control program. Uh, the national level. We also have a state um, tuberculosis and leprosy control program that runs programs for prevention and intervention across um, the, the states. So uh, it has been around for a very long time, so much that the zeal, you know, when the new disease comes up, there is usually the zeal, the curiosity, it makes headlines, people pick it up, it's sensational, so that way it, it's kept in, on the front burner. But this is, has been along for a very long time, probably longer than, in fact, actually longer than um, most all the people living on Earth at the moment. People come to the world and meet tuberculosis. So it's not a news-breaking event. So the attention that it needs, it deserves in terms of publicity, awareness campaign is uh, deficient in my opinion. Okay. Uh, Dr. Ogada, do you share the same opinion with him that there is low awareness about TB? I do. Because, like you said, the disease has been with us. And the emphasis that used to be about the disease has uh, reduced, especially with the onset of uh, COVID since 2020. When COVID came, the most of the government attention was focused on COVID. 
and they forgot about TB. And that's why we're having a resurgence in the increase in the incidence of the disease. And so most of the people are not aware, like you also mentioned, of even where to seek help. Point of care and facilities, most of them do not know where it is located. And we, we have not been seeing the flyers, the posters that has to do with TB, treatment, control, and the rest that we used to see 10 years ago. Most times, about 10 years ago, if you go to hospitals, primary health care centers, and the rest, you will see information on their notice board everywhere about TB, how to seek care, and the rest. But now, what you find is that of COVID, and you hardly see that of TB. So because of that, a lot of people have not been aware. Even uh, electronic and print media have not been talking so much about the disease. But we are, we are, uh, we are different. Now. I think we are. Yes. <laughs> because yeah. that we are talking about it. it. now. Uh, you <laughs> okay. are different. <laughs> All right. Uh, Dr. Anza, let's talk about the symptoms of uh, tuberculosis. What are the eight symptoms? Okay. Um, if it's um, pulmonary, as if it's affecting the lungs, which is the commonest that uh, people usually identify, uh, there will be cough. This cough. Um, this cough usually lasts, uh, it's a cough that lasts for a long time. We talk about chronic, we call it chronic cough. It's chronic cough. Usually, um, any individual who has been coughing consistently for more than two weeks needs to be evaluated, needs to be evaluated um, in this respect. This cough, this cough usually um, uh, would contain blood. There might be blood, it might be blood stained, uh, what is called um, hemoptysis. It might be cough that is blood stained. The individual will have what is called low grade fever. Uh, person will have fever for a duration, and this fever will not be very high, but the fever will be there nonetheless. The individual may have weight loss, noticeable weight loss, that um, is not uh, a, a, um, you know, accounted for by other conditions that uh, the individual may be having. And um, the person also may have what is called drenching night sweats. When we say drenching night sweats, it's the person sleeps and uh, by the time they wake up, their bed sheets, their bed sprays are soaked in sweat. And this, are, this is um, it's something that they've not been experiencing before. They go to bed and they have this sweat, drench, called drenching night sweat. You know. uh, other symptoms will depend on the site. Additional symptoms will not depend on the site of the infection. Because if it affects uh, the abdomen, there can be sometimes swell, swelling of the abdomen, you know, this tended abdomen. But these are not specific symptoms. The specific symptoms are, are those that I have um, already mentioned. Then they, in evaluating this kind of person, there may be history of um, um, contact with somebody who has been coughing also in a similar manner. So usually by the time a, a, a patient comes to the clinic and has been coughing, we want to know, are there other people around you who have been coughing in a similar manner? Other people, have you made contact with somebody else who has been coughing like this? Maybe a, a roommate or a family member, a close family member, or are you a healthcare worker who has been attending to people who have been coughing in this manner? You know, we want to know, have you been consuming unpasteurized milk? She talked about that uh, earlier. Milk from cows that has, has not been boiled, has not been boiled. No, no. Have you been consuming? No, no. Because bovine tuberculosis, you know, is transmitted that way. So these are some of the things we want to look out for in a patient. Then um, tuberculosis, uh, the, what is important to be noted is that the, the, there is what is called latent tuberculosis. When you talk about latent tuberculosis, it is tuberculosis that is hidden. These individuals have, have um, the microbacterium in their body, but uh, because the immune system is still competent, the immune system is still, um, in, lay, in a layman's term, strong enough to suppress the manifestation of the symptoms of this condition. They don't present with symptoms. But if they have a immuno, any source of immunocompromise, immunosuppression, any, anything that suppresses their immune system, 
whether malnutrition, uh, pregnancy, or any other conditions. Notably, today we talk about HIV AIDS. Any condition that suppresses the immune system can now provide opportunity for the tuberculosis that was lying fallow, was lying hidden, to begin to manifest itself. So it's um, and uh, in these environments, the, it's it's uh, it's common, and uh, many people are believed to have that latent tuberculosis. But the, because the immune system are competent, they do not present the signs and symptoms. So immunosuppression is one of the risk factors for individuals presenting with. So somebody, they, they, why I'm making this point is that somebody who comes to my clinic maybe tomorrow that, and has, a, has been having symptoms of tuberculosis in the past uh, maybe one month may not necessarily have gotten infected in the, last, in the last one month or even two months. This may be, there may be other health events, related health events that have suppressed this person's immune system, which have now made room for latent tuberculosis that have been lying there all along to manifest itself. All right. Yeah, listen, in case you're just tuned in, you've been listening to Perspectives on I Get Radio 95.5 Star FM, Marco de Benway State. We are discussing World Tuberculosis Day, which was marked yesterday, and uh, this morning we are focusing on its awareness, uh, causative factors, and modes of prevention. And leading us in the discussion here in the studio is an associate professor of veterinary public health and a member of the Nigerian Veterinary Medical Association. Uh, uh, well, she is of the Department of Veterinary Public Health and Preventive Medicine, Joseph Sawantaka University, Marco the Dr. Charity Agada. We also have an epidemiologist at the Benue State University Teaching Hospital. He is of the Department of Epidemiology and Community Health at that hospital, Dr. Msute Anza. They are sharing thoughts with us to enlighten us more about this uh, disease, which uh, it has been said that has caused so much uh, uh, pressure on human beings, and that is why we are focusing on you too can contribute on the program. We told you earlier that the program is audience interactive, and if you just joined us, we'd like to remind you again that the program is audience interactive, and at 10 o'clock, the line for calls will be available for you to phone in. That line through which you can reach us via calls at 10 o'clock is 0814335292. 0814335292. The line will be available at 10 o'clock for calls. Meanwhile, the one for text messages and WhatsApp chat is 0912699404. 0912699404. That line is already activated, and if you have a question or a contribution to make on what we are discussing, you can send us a text or a chat on that line, 0912699404. Remember to include your name and the location you are sending the message from. Let's also remind you that the program is streaming live on all our social media platforms, including Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram. And it's such as I get radio and television on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube, and follow the live stream conversation. You may drop your comments there. If they are related to the subject we are discussing, we may take it as your contribution. Dr. Gada, let me come back to you now. Uh, talking about the symptoms, the ones that human beings manifest and animals, are they largely the same or is there some kind of difference? So you mean the symptoms? Symptoms of the tuberculosis. In animals? Uh, yes. Do we have them different from animals or the ones that the humans exhibit? Anyway, a human being by uh, scientific cl uh, classification is also an animal, though a higher animal, I think so, <laughs> right? Okay, the, yes. the symptoms of uh, the, the disease in, in cattle is not as obvious as that of a human. Okay. But you find the cattle coughing or sneezing for a long time. But one of the important things you will notice is that there will be marked, massive loss of weight. The animal will be lean and will be big. That is it. But some, you may find some that are looking healthy, normal, without coughing. So most times, what we do is to dictate such, we carry out a uh, testing on the animals. So we run uh, the tuberculin testing. That's a skin test to know if the animal has it or not. In our 
country, we usually don't do that. But in the developed world, because the disease affects trees, if a farm or a country has it and has not been controlling the disease in cattle, most of these other um, countries will not buy products from them or will not even trade in their animals. So they do that routinely. They carry out routine farm checks, tobacco testing, testing in, on the cattle. And most times if the cattle are found to have the disease that is they are tested positive, they are usually slaughtered. They are sent to the abattoir and slaughtered. And if, depending on the type of organ that are affected, if it is partial, they will just trim the organ and pass. So pass the remaining part of the meat for consumption. So that one, we refer to it as partial condemnation. But if the lesion or the... It, it, the disease presents as nodules, we call it tobacco, on the and, uh, organs affected. And those tobaccos are usually strong. And the one that is caused by TB, you, when you use the knife to cut through the tobacco, you have a feeling as if you're cutting through sand. So that one is classic for TB lesion. So we call it part of no money. So you cut it as if you're feeling through sound. We refer to it as gritty sound. So that is what we use to confirm because there are other animal diseases that present as nodules affecting organs of the animal. But by that of the TB is usually yellowish, cheesy like looking. And when you cut, when you cut open, you find cheesy like um, lesions inside. But as you're cutting with your knife, you feel as if you're cutting through sand. So that indicates that those needles, nodules are caused by mycobacterium bovis. And so that is what we do. So like unlike humans that have a drenching sweat in the night, yes. you may not be able to detect the cattle sweating. But when the cattle has persistent cough for a long period, you start suspecting TB. Even though there's another disease of animal, CBPP, that's contagious bovine pleuropneumonia, that also present as cough. So that is why we need to go a step further to carry out the tobacco testing on your animal to confirm if it is the bovine TB that's affecting the cattle or not. Okay, but in the animal classification, beyond the cattle, are there other animals that are also susceptible to coming down with at, uh, tuberculosis. Yes, all animals are susceptible to coming down with TB. All animals, both wildlife. And we're having cases in wildlife because they prey on the cattle or the herbivores in the wild that may be infected. So if there are infected cattle around the wildlife areas or conservation areas or infected buffaloes around that area and the carnivores as the lions the tigers and the rest prey on such animals they'll come down with the tb so all animals can be infected with tb okay dr anza so what looking at the symptoms now what are the causes of tb in human beings Okay, well, I mentioned, we've already mentioned the principal uh, culprit, which is the um, inhuman mycobacterium uh, tuberculosis, the causative organism. Mm -hmm. Then there are risk factors um, that predispose an individual to having um, coming down with tuberculosis. And uh, I already mentioned, I alluded to one of them earlier when I talked about immunosuppression. Individuals who, whose immune system is no longer um, competent, no longer as functional as it, it should be for a, a healthy human being, already stand the risk of coming down with um, tuberculosis. The, the, this risk um, results from, first of all, the a latent, latent tuberculosis that they may have becoming active because of the um, recession or the suppression of the immune system. 
it can also it also comes from the fact that they are now more predisposed to um you know to contracting the infection um you can if you, know, if you make contact with somebody who has tuberculosis it 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 is not compulsory it is not 100% 100% that you must come down with the infection that's why sometimes you can have in a facility a patient can present and there can be a relative who has been care attending to this individual for a while or a family member who has been living together in the same house or compound and if they are screened or tested they may be found not to have the condition you know so this the factor that accounts for this is the person's immune system so apart from the causative organism the pe individual's immune status is a, an important factor uh, when considering tuberculosis infection now how does um the how does the uh, bacterium spread yeah, it, it's, it's an airborne infection so it's spread through um, sneezes cough you know even through singing anything that can that, that can cause air droplets from the respiratory tract of an infected person to be disseminated to be spread into the air can can, can predispose individuals who inhale that such um, air from con contracting the disease condition then um, she talked about con um, uh, you know consumption of food yes um, you know um, milk from infected um, cattle consumption of the meat as well other products that come from other animal products that come from there individuals who work in these places the the butchers at the abattoir and, and then the, the headers who take care of this cattle all of these individuals stand a certain risk of contracting the disease then um, individuals who are healthcare workers doctors nurses pharmacies anybody at all that works within the healthcare sector setting because this is this is a place where individuals who have tuberculosis come for care they stand a chance of contracting tuberculosis. So those are the risk factors. And we also say that uh, it's a disease of um, it's a disease of poverty, it's a disease of low socioeconomic uh, um, status, because the risk factors, some of the risk factors that we have mentioned are socioeconomic. Uh, you have uh, the individuals who are living in overcrowded accommodation, there's inadequate ventilation. So you know. Yeah, more or less breathing in, you know, what other people have exhaled because of poor ventilation. The housing houses are small in terms of their sizes. There are too many people living in the same enclosed space. Construction of the houses, the ventilation, there's no cross ventilation. Maybe you find one small window, there's no corresponding um, um, cross ventilation in the in the building. So the poor housing, essentially, mm -hmm. they are dealing with pover a case, case of um, poverty where uh, people who, are, who maybe they are raising cattle and then there's a, a, a condition, you know, they can see obviously that like this animal is sick, but um, because of hunger, you know, they, are, they, they are not disposed to, you know, discarding this animal, even if it has been certified uh, uh, not fit for human consumption. Mm -hmm. People can uh, uh, try to find a way to smuggle it out to be sold to consumers, and even consumers that know for sure that this animal is not healthy because they are going to get it at a poorer uh, rate than the standard uh, market price may be tempted to buy you know so these are some other conditions then you talk about um, um, access to health care the ability of individuals who come because tuberculosis is treatable and curable mm -hmm. but when do people present to the health care facility when do they present yes we are going to come to okay. all of that the diagnosis and other preventive measures for it but for now dr agada let me come back to you Mm -hmm. Earlier on, you uh, talked about the detection of uh, tuberculosis in cattle at the abattoir, for instance. Is there some form of awareness that people operating at the abattoirs need to have concerning uh, the presence of tuberculosis in animals at the slaughter uh, for public consumption? There is the need for workers in the abattoir to be aware. Most of them are aware. Most of the butchers are aware of uh, the tuberculosis in cattle. Even the pastoralists that raise them, they, they are aware. And most times it's because they do not want to lose the resources that they use to buy the animal that they send the meat to 
the market. And it's because government has stopped paying compensa compensation to butchers or to farmers. Because if they were paying compensation, the butchers can easily come out to present the animals uh, or the carcass that has been infected. Do you understand? Yes. So, but because government is not paying the compensation, the butcher is going to lose his resources. Most times they hide it. But even those that are not aware, we've been carrying out sensitization to the abattoirs, to the pastoralists, and the rest. And we discovered that most of them have some good knowledge about the disease, especially those that are in the that have been in the business for a long time. And some of them can describe the symptoms or the PM lesions. That's the PM signs that shows that this cattle has TB lesions. Some of them can do that. So you, we know that, okay, they have some good knowledge. But it's just that, like I said, because of economic reasons, they are engaged in practices that can lead to the meat the infected meat going to the public. So that's why the there's emphasis laid on having meat inspectors, trained professionals at the abattoir to carry out adequate meat inspection. And we also need to have slaughter slabs or abattoirs that have incinerators so that when we condemn such organs, they are properly disposed. And these butchers will not go back to have access to it. Or animals that we have roaming the abattoirs, like I told you, all animals can be infected. And most of us, some people have dogs that they don't care, take care of. They are free roaming. So you have dogs around slaughter slabs and the rest. So if such organs are condemned and thrown just in the dustbin or in the dumping site, at the dumping site, these dogs go to such place and eat such meat. And they have owners, they go back home. Once they are infected, the children of the owners play with the dogs and can get exposed and come down with the disease. So these are some of the things we need to do. Like you said, you asked about creating the awareness. Yes. We do that and we try to uh, tell them and because it is a chronic infection, most times the butchers, some of them go ahead and even cut the meat and shoot raw and tell you that nothing will happen to me. So because it's a chronic infection, and he talked about one having the latent TB, you can have the infection and may not have the disease. So some of them may have the infection because they consume infected meat. They drink uh, raw milk because if you tell them you need to boil the meat they will tell you that our forefathers have been taking it and nothing is happening so they will take it they have the disease they are infected but they may not be down with the TB it will take some time when all these other factors he talked about malnutrition immunosuppression and the rest and some of the immunosuppressive disease may not be just HIV AIDS it can come down with uh, diabetes. It can also have uh, cancer. And that will make the TB to remove. All right. Now let me come back to you, Dr. Anza. Let's look at the areas where people, are there people who are more prone to contracting a TB in terms of age classification? Well, yes. Um, I spoke earlier about, generally I spoke earlier about uh, in, in individuals who are immunosuppressed, individuals who are immunosuppressed, people who have other disease conditions like HIV, we added to the list tuberculosis, cancer, malnutrition. Um, when we talk about um, uh, age, yeah, and you talk about immunosuppression, you are looking at the extremes of age. Extremes of age, the, the um, young, um, young people at the other end, extreme of the spectrum, and then the elderly. Uh, these um, young people are, um, are, are prone to immunosuppression because 
their immune system is not yet well developed. They are still developing, so their immune system is not well developed. And then the elderly, um, where anti has caught up with them, so their immune system is waning, it's about to check out. Mm. So these extremes of age are individuals which, if you talk in terms of age, uh, uh, have, have higher uh, you know, uh, inclination, higher risk to, of, uh, of developing tuberculosis. Um, apart from that, we are talking about um, uh, lifestyle. We are talking about individuals who, you know, uh, who um, she talked about um, the workers at Abattoirs, the, the mentality, they, they are not predisposed to um, adjusting to new knowledge in terms of um, the risk fact, the risk that they, their particular profession, poses to them to developing tuberculosis. So these are some of the um, conditions or classes of persons that are uh, in the general population that stand a higher risk of developing tuberculosis. Individuals who also are, who are family members, close family members who have the infection or who are taking care of our caregivers to patients or who are uh, uh, healthcare professionals. And then um, for the younger, younger population, individuals who have not been vaccinated, because there's um, fascination for tuberculosis, against tuberculosis at birth. Individuals who are maybe in rural communities or who are living in internally displaced persons camps, who have no uh, access to um, regular healthcare services, uh, may, 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 may not be vaccinated, may not be properly vaccinated at birth. And so this is also another class of persons that has a high chance of contracting disease, the tuberculosis infection compared to the general population. Okay, when you mentioned individuals who are not vaccinated, does it mean TB is vaccine pre uh, preventable? Yes, it is. Okay, and at what stage, if it is vaccine pre uh, preventable, at what stage is one meant to get the vaccine to prevent uh, coming down with uh, TB? There's a vaccine for tuberculosis, BCG, that's given at birth. It's given at birth. It's, it's part of the routine um, national program on immunization. So it's anywhere that um, uh, a child is born in a healthcare facility, part of the uh, routine um, immun vaccinations that the child should get at birth is um, BCG, which is protective of uh, tuberculosis. In most facilities where immunization services are offered, it is integrated there. So. The, page, the parents may not know specifically, you know, that uh, this is given against tuberculosis, but if they adhere to the um, vaccination routine that's been given to them at the uh, healthcare, se se um, healthcare center, they are almost certain to receive uh, BCG. That's the vaccine against tuberculosis. All right. Dr. Ogada, is there something you would like, like, like to add to this with regards to the classification of people coming down uh, with TB? Yes. You uh, were itching to say something. So. Yes. Those that smoke cigarettes also. Cigarette smoking because it's also affecting the lung. So it's also a, a risk factor. And, you know, some share their cigarette stick in the course of the sharing. If someone has pulmonary TB, he can give it to the, his partner when they are sh sharing. And also in the rural area, those that consume alcohol, the bukuku, they also share calabash. <laughs> and the rest. So those are, yes. and from our study, it's also a risk factor that they can also get in, um, infected. Well, when, when you mentioned bukuku, mm -hmm. I, I was laughing because uh, the person listening, in the rural community, in a broker to buy a joint. The ones taking the alcoholic drink and they share. You know, in the rural area, they would like to share. You see, you will find two people sharing the drink with one calabash. Yes. Uh -huh. so. <laughs> well, that is understandable. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Anza, let's look at in terms of uh, diagnosis. How early do people present to be? Uh, the diagnosed for uh, uh, TB when it is uh, detected. When you talk about early, how early, they ask how early people present. It's um, it's a it's a difficult thing because um, we have a very poor health seeking behavior in our environment. Uh, I saw something. Somebody was trying to was trying to compare uh, the pathways between uh, you know when somebody 
maybe uh, they have a problem, a legal problem. They the arrow moves straight from the person who has a problem to the lawyer. But when they have a health condition, the arrow moves first to family and friends. From family and friends, it moves to maybe a herbalist. Mm-hmm. From there, it can move to the internet. From the internet, it can go back to a chemist. Mm-hmm. From a chemist, it can go to a side lab. Mm-hmm. Before it finally makes contact with a uh, you know an, uh, a competent healthcare professional. So healthcare seeking behavior is poor. Usually, what people do, people who have a cough, who start to have a cough, are more likely to go walk into a medicine store by the roadside to. Um, and then buy a few antibiotics here and there and go and take maybe for just three days or for whatever duration. If that doesn't work, they are likely to hear from a family member who claims to know somebody who is competent in herbs, who, you know, they treated somebody, I know somebody who had a similar cough in uh, the next village. And uh, when he went to a certain place, this in, in individual pr- prepared her- herbal uh, drinks for the person and it was cured. And they followed through that. So while they are doing this, two things are happening. First of all, they are abusing antibiotics. They are abusing an inappropriate use of antibiotics. Um, these antibiotics take a lot of resources to, to, you know, into research to develop, and is increasing antibiotic resistance, which is, um, there was a time there were no antibiotics. Life was, you can only try to imagine how, how brutish and how poor life was. Now, we are headed towards a period where they may be very limited or no antibiotics because the ones that we have are becoming a lot of antibiotic resistance is coming. So they are, they are, they are, they are, they are predisposing themselves and they are putting the rest of us at the risk of increasing antibiotic, um, uh, antimicrobial resistance. Then two, they are given the um, infection time to grow, to multiply, to replicate in their bodies. Notice that we talked earlier about um, pulmonary and extra pulmonary tuberculosis. Tuberculosis can occur in the lungs and from the lungs disseminate. It can spread from the lungs to other places. So early uh, presentation and intervention is key in winning this, uh, winning the fight, both as, um, both as at the community level. Because this individual, why is moving from one place to another to seek um, uh, care that is not optimal and is not appropriate, is also giving himself or herself more time to transmit this con- this disease, this infection. The, the longer the infection stays in the community, undetected, undiagnosed, untreated, the longer the opportunity for transmission, the higher the number of individuals transmitted, the higher the burden of the disease on the community. So this is um, so when you talk about presentation, people don't present early to the to the healthcare facility. They don't, and this is not just a, a case of, in the case of tuberculosis. The general um, healthcare, poor healthcare seeking behavior. But if they will come to the healthcare facility, um, they are going to be properly evaluated. The, the TB, pro, TB and leprosy control programs in the state is, um, you know, is, is, is essentially free, offers essentially free services. So from the point of testing to treatment, the initiation, continuation and everything, the, 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 the individual is not going to incur any, ex, any cost, any personal cost that's directly linked to the treatment, apart from maybe the cost of their transportation to the healthcare facility. So they just have to come to the healthcare facility. That's all. The rest of the care is provided for them free of charge. Okay. So in terms of the care, like you mentioned, do we have such facilities available? You are involved in the health sector. So let me just ask you on a general note, do we have such facilities in Penway? Yes, we do. We do. What we should talk about maybe is the spread of such facilities. Because ideally, um, because this is a disease of public health importance, ideally we should be talking about handling this condition at the primary health care level, the prim- level of the primary health centers. Yes, the primary health centers are the closest um, layer of health care service available to the population. It is supposed to be the first point of uh, contact, first point of seeking care to the population. And um, it operates at the, the, the world level. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's supposed to operate at the world level. So what we, we should be talking about now is how can we um, revitalize, revive the um, primary health care centers, you know, equip them adequately, and then provide adequate, competent um, manpower so that these conditions, because if, they, if we have um, the primary health care centers working and fully equipped and staffed, they can even go around the community to do case findings because they are living there with the communities. 
they are the closest to the people. It will be easier to detect individuals who are maybe coughing, chronically coughing, and who are not coming to the health facility. You know, so that if um, the if uh, Mohammed does not come to the mountain, it will be easier for the mountain to go to Mohammed. But now we have these facilities. Most general hospitals have. They do free testing. If you if you come um, coughing without even a private facility, they can either collect the sample, collect your sputum sample into a container mm -hmm. and send to a general uh, hospital, or send you there on referral. You just walk in there, produce the sputum, they collect it. Do run the test and return the results, and they can you can be enrolled into treatment uh, into the treatment um, program free of charge. So these facilities exist in Benue. Most of our general hospitals have this, and a few private hospitals also, you know, um, run this this healthcare services. And then if you come to the teaching hospital, we do as well. But what we need to emphasize now is how can we take these services closer to the people? How can we leverage on the primary healthcare system? to ensure that these services are readily accessible and um, available to the people who need them at minimal um, cost, cost of transportation. All right. Dear listeners, it's about time now for us to start engaging with you listening to us. Remember, we are focusing on World Tuberculosis Day, which was observed yesterday, and we are raising awareness about the disease on this edition of Perspectives. The number to reach, uh, which you can reach us is 0814335292. 08143359292. Once you connect with us, with us in the studio, tell us your name and where you are calling from. Then you go ahead and make your contribution. If it's a contribution you want to make or a question to seek clarification on what TB is about and other issues concerning it, feel free to utilize that line. Remember to tell us your name and where you are calling from. Once you connect with us, the line for text message is 0912699404. 0912699404. That line is also available for text messages and WhatsApp chat. You may utilize it to contribute or ask questions if you have them. Also, the program is streaming live on all our social media platforms. And this search that I get ready on Facebook, uh, Instagram, and YouTube and follow the live stream conversation to be a part of the program. Uh, just before we start taking calls, Dr. Ogada, let me come back to you once again. In terms of consumption of uh, meat that is unhealthy from animals that are infected with uh, tuberculosis, what kind of awareness do people who buy this meat need to have? First of all, we had earlier talked about those in the abattoir. So what kind of awareness people at the community level and households need to get concerning uh, accessing meat from public places for consumption? Okay. No, um, thank you for the question. It's very important for them to note that currently... I, I beg your pardon. Just before you expand your thoughts on that, let's uh, engage with course already waiting on the line. I'll come back to you on that. Okay. Hello, good morning. Uh, hello, good morning. Morning to you. Yes. Um, uh, I'm Kwaza Vincent, calling from North Bank, Makodi. Good to have you on the program, Kwaza Vincent. Yes, my regards to the guests in the studio. Yes, Thank yes, you. they have Thank done you. justice to the topic of uh, this issue of tuberculosis, and they have uh, they have said everything that I need to know about tuberculosis. But my question goes this way: at, uh, when somebody is infected with this tuberculosis, this TB, at what um, stage, maybe at what uh, interval, does the person this, uh, start um, is, uh, manifesting the symptoms? At what interval does such person begin to manifest that symptoms like coughing and other symptoms? That is my question. All right. Thank you, uh, Kwaza Vincent. We will speak to your question you. uh, shortly as we go along. We appreciate you. Okay. We will we'll attend to that question. But, Dr. Agada, please expand your thoughts. You were uh, speaking to us on what uh, the community and people at the household level need to know about accessing meat, especially from public places, so as not to... Uh, to mitigate the chances of buying meat infected. Okay. The general public needs to be aware, especially on the cases of uh, these incidents of diseases, like we, we've had cases of anthrax that we know that is a, a highly infectious disease. And now we're talking about tuberculosis. 
So the general public needs to be careful when it comes to buying meat, especially meat that is cooked, maybe cooked fried, and the people are using it to, are hawking it round. We know that there are some specific places where you have barbecue meat or ready-to-eat meat that has been, been sold. But there are some individuals that you see that are, that do not normally hawk meat. Then suddenly you see them hawking uh, already prepared meat or ready to eat meat. You have to be wary of that and be careful. And especially if you see the meat having nodules, some people it will look once it is cooked it will look like it has a goosey balls. That one will tell you that. That meat is infected with TB. That's a mycobacterium bodies. Some mama put, like in the southwest, because I did my work in the southwest. Okay. They call it uh, uh, lungs with a goosey balls. That some, even in the mama put joint, some people prefer it because the lungs look very big and has a goosey ball. But we try to create awareness and tell them that if you eat such meat, you're eating infected meat. So they need to know that even when they go to buy meat on the butcher's table and the meat has nodules or lumps, that's the way I can uh, describe so that they can understand, yes. nodules or lumps that is looking as if it is a... Uh, uh, it, it is a goosey balls like that. That's how it looks. And when they cut through, they are having a feel as if they are cutting through sand. They should not buy such meat because it is an infected meat from a cattle that is infected. So any meat that has, that is not looking like meat, that has lumps in between, they should be very careful. Be wary and not, of it. Okay. And not buy it. All right. Hello, good morning. Hello. Uh, good morning, Sir Nathaniel. Morning to you. Uh, how was your night? Very well. All my regards to your guest in the studio. I'm Kwangota from Gwajimba. Okay, thank you, Kwangota. How is Gwajimba this morning? We give glory to God. Okay. Please speak to us, uh, Sorry, I'm interested in this topic. It was something that has been bothering me for quite a long time. So. Yes. I also ask a question. My question is, is there anything like prevention against this tobacco like anti tobacco like so like uh, other disease will have my uh, uh, injections for it, uh, sorry, vaccines for it to uh, to prevent it or control it. Is there anything of sort to this uh, tobacco? Okay. Kwango Taf, could that be all from you? No, and then uh, I want to appear again that if there is any way they will uh, encourage the doctors to maybe make an awareness, especially in the rural areas where people are not even interested in going to hospitals. They, like we, they, they, they were saying about the Brook to issue there. We say that they are laughing because I was close to the Brook to joint and I was thinking. So just if, if there is an awareness, people know there are some people they drink and they don't even know that they will get affected or disease. In, they drink or they cut them or drink it. So if there's any way they can at least make an awareness, especially in the rural areas, it will matter because most of people don't know, uh, don't have knowledge about this tuberculosis. It even means that I'm talking, I don't have much knowledge about tuberculosis. I don't know, know anything about it. If, if, so if there's anything so like you know, awareness, we'll be happy. Even as you are listening to us, are you still not uh, getting awareness about it? It's just today, I'm just that is why I say I'm interested and I'm happy about the topic. Okay. Because I'm enjoying this. Something that has been bothering me for a long time. Okay, thank you very much for sharing your concerns with us. We will speak to your question. The question you asked us, we'll respond to each other too. Thank you very much. Sir. Have a nice time. And you too, Kwango Taha. Thank you very much for your contribution. <laughs> it's as if that example of Rukutu, <laughs> you knew where Kwango Taha was before you brought it up. But let's uh, respond to some of the two questions we have asked. Uh, uh, We've been asked from our listeners. First was from Quaz uh, Vincent. At what stage does one start manifesting symptoms of TB? Uh, we'll have you respond to that, uh, Dr. Anza. Well, um, 
like we said earlier in the course of the program, manifestation of signs and symptoms of tuberculosis depends on a number of factors. Yes, the first I talked about latent tuberculosis. So when we want to know from the point of infection to the point of manifestation of symptoms, it's, it, it varies, it varies and it depends on a number of other factors more than on the, inf the infection itself. Because people can have this latent tuberculosis and they're walking about with it for years, for years. The uh, body is able to contain its, its spread, its multiplication, so they don't come down with any symptoms. Then uh, down the line, the, the, uh, the immune system is compromised. They come down with a severe disease, diabetes, um, um, cancer. They come down with HIV. You know, they are malnourished. Then suddenly, tuberculosis pops up. It doesn't mean that they, they contracted the infection only within the recent period. The infection might have been there for a much longer period. Secondly, people who already have, who already have these immunosuppress, immunosuppressive conditions, maybe they first they have HIV, AIDS, they first have, um, um, they are malnourished, or they have any of these other immunocompromising com, immuno, uh, conditions before their exposure to the, um, uh, the uh, bacilli. If this happens, then they can present with symptoms in a very short period of time. But you cannot put a timeline to it and say, within uh, maybe 21 days or so, this is the exact period within which somebody who has uh, had contact with uh, the infect the uh, bacterium must come down with signs and symptoms. There are a number of other factors that interplay that determine the point of, that determine the duration from the point of exposure to the point of presentation of signs and symptoms. Okay, so I believe, uh, Vincent, you have listened to us. Hello, good morning. Uh, morning, Nugget Radio. Morning. And, uh, Mr. Nathania. Good morning to you. Uh, morning, honestly. I'm Dan Atai from uh, Kwara Farquhar. Good to have you join Marcus. us, Dan Atai. Yeah, you are doing a great job. Uh, this awareness is, is a, a serious one. Thank you. I Daniel. want to thank you, especially for that, and uh, Nugget Radio for this wonderful work they are doing for us. Thank you for your kind words, Daniel. <laughs> thank you. You see, uh, uh, not I sometimes I get tired talking about uh, uh, health policies and how it can be eradicated or prevented. Remember that we are now uh, sixty something years with our independence, and uh, just the health, which is the most important thing, land abroad to this. Just go to Morocco here. Uh, you want to cross to Spain. The moment you are in Morocco, immigration will hold you. The first thing they will do is to vaccinate you. They will, they will hold your mouth and drop something in your mouth so that you will not infect anybody. How did they come to that? Whether you carry any disease, you will not be able to infect anybody again. And they, they have compulsorily vaccinated you. The level at which our head is taking the priority the government is giving to our head is bad. Apart from tobacco losses, people who are talking about so. At the level we are now, we should not be talking about just, we should be talking about complete eradication. Everybody has to have, in fact, you, oh my God, I just can't, we, is, I don't know whether it's God that is protecting us, if not, to wipe this nation away, this, this common disease that you have used tobacco losses, uh, what do you call the other one, hepatitis, that is highly prevalent. The government is look, they are not the the sensitization is is not known. Very like a Jessica, you go to hospital, they want somebody wants you to bribe him or her face before they vaccinate. Usually, the vaccines have been subsidized by government. You will see some health workers trying to collect bribes from you. Things like that. It's what a nation. I'm tired, to be honest. And we should change our attitude. Thank you, I get with you. And God bless you. <laughs> Thank you, Dana. Don't be tired. We hope that our awareness will yield results. And that is why when Dan mentioned that when you go to Morocco and you are compulsorily vaccinated, I, I felt uh, somehow awkward. <laughs> I wouldn't love to be <laughs> vaccinated under compulsion. But <laughs> we hope that. Hello, good morning. Hello. You are speaking with Papa Ladro from Buruk, local government area of Benue State. 
Tafa Lazarus? Yes. Okay, which part of Buruku Tafa Lazarus are you reaching us from? I'm speaking from Bike and Council West in Kusu. Okay, thank you very much, Tafa, for joining us. How is uh, Kusu this morning? We are cool. All right. Please, we are listening to you, Tafa. Okay, thank you. You see, this issue of uh, tuberculosis you are, you are talking about, I could remember sometime in 2004 when I took my dad to Mka, he was suffering from diabetes. He was there admitted in World 6 at Mka. And in that World 6 room, there were up to five tuberculosis cases in admission. And what surprises me then was the cleaners who came into the hospital, into the room. Instead of mopping the room, they took broom and started with the house with so much dust flying here and there. So I had to stop them that they should rather mop the house. They told me I did not employ them. What I did was I immediately went to the administrative block and reported them. Before the authorities came in and stopped them from sweeping the room. Within all the period I stayed there, the, the, the cleaners, they wouldn't like to see me. They, were, they became so hateful. So I'm uh, asking the, the, the health authorities to please sensitize those working in hospitals. And besides that, I want to ask is it right for other patients to be admitted in the same room with people with tuberculosis? Thank you, and God bless you. Thank you so much, Kwango. Uh, Lazarus Tafa, for sharing this experience with us. This is very, very instructive. We will uh, respond to your question. And let's begin with a question from Tafa Lazarus. Is it right? I'll, again, I'll come to you, Dr. Anza. You listen to Tafa Lazarus. Is it right to admit people with TB in the same room, like the experience he shared with us of people at a hospital, which he mentioned? And we don't want to uh, continue mentioning the hospital anyway. Speak to us. It's Dr. not. Anza. It's not right. The standard practice is that the, if you go to any hospital, there is a separate ward for tuberculosis patients. There's a separate ward for chest. Uh, in fact, we even have a chest clinic. There's a separate ward for tuberculosis patients. You don't admit other categories of patients in the same ward as tuberculosis patients because for obvious reasons, which we have already mentioned. All right, so uh, we'll come back. There are more issues to uh, talk about, but let's engage with more people. Hello, good morning. Hello, good morning, sir. Morning to you. Thank you. My name is Sibla Yema Akura. I'm just a person from Banku, Bacha, in Boko Haram government. All right, good to have you on the program, Sibla Yema Akura. You're welcome, sir. My regards to your guests in the studio. Yes, my guests are greeting oh. you too. I'm responding on their behalf. And all of us say. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. But to me, my opinion here is that as we are doing the awareness here, creation, another factor that can help to prevent the diseases that you are talking about. And those of the people that are having uh, the tuberculosis patients in their various destinations, they should take proper care of their sputum. When speaking, they will avoid it openly. They let them have containers for them to put in the spotting inside so that they will take them outside and, and bury it. And those of uh, some people that are used to uh, drink together as <laughs> your guests are really treated, they should avoid that habit. And I want to appeal here to the government that, considering the economic quagmire that we are facing in this country, let there be monthly vaccination for the the the, the, the head that are, let let government have health workers that train that particular disease so that they will be roaming about and giving instruction to the general public, particularly those that are in the rural areas, so that they will be aware. You know, as the resurgence of new COVID and uh, 
HIV. It seems as the crisis is no, no, no more in existence. So, to do that, it's okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Ibaima. Thank you very much. The network is getting yeah. friendly, but you have made your submission. We appreciate you. Dr. Anza, uh, let's uh, have you respond to earlier on Wango Taha from Bajimba had asked us, I know you spoke about preventive uh, measures with regards to vaccination, but maybe you want to refresh us on that, especially that Wango Taha brought up a question in that regard. What can be done in terms of uh, vaccination preventive uh, uh, TB, preventing TB? Okay, um, prevention, um, we look at a number of uh, measures that can be taken. These measures can be taken at the level of the individual, they can be taken at the level of uh, maybe the family, they can also be taken at the level of um, policy, uh, community or state or national um, policy. At the level of the individual, um, there's the need to practice um, hand hygiene hand hygiene, um, in addition to what I would like to call uh, cough hygiene. You know, uh, you, during the advent of um, COVID-19, the COVID-19 pandemic, a number of uh, measures were introduced and um, um, disseminated, escalated around the country concerning how to handle, um, uh, how, to, how to prevent infecting other people around you when you are coughing. For instance, you know, people, you stay in an enclosed an enclosure with other people with in close proximity and you, you are about to sneeze or to cough. You have to find a way to cover your nose and cover your mouth. And if you use your hands to do that, I see people do that a lot of time. They just use their palms, sneeze into them, and uh, maybe they rub. If they use the left palm, they rub the right palm and can, and, and can keep on moving. It's dangerous. Because and the, even be extending handshakes to people. In, in another moment, they are exchanging handshakes with other people. They are maybe even um, you know handling food and other things that other people will consume. So what was what is taught and advocated is that if you if you because you, of course you don't uh, rehearse sneezing, it can come up any moment. If you are going to sneeze, the standard thing which is advisable is that if, if you can use a handkerchief to do that to sneeze into it, fine. But the moment you do that, you wash your hands find a place to wash your hands or sanitize your hands. If you can't do that, conveniently, do that into the corner of your elbow. You know, you sneeze into here. It's far easier. There's far less contact between this place and other people, social contact between here and other people than with the palms of your hands. So people need to practice hand hygiene. They need to practice cough hygiene for those who are infected and the hand hygiene for everybody. Then secondly, um, there is a need for, you know, um, when we are talking about planning, you know, housing, there is a need for adequate housing because this is a disease that, um, uh, you know, thrives in overcrowded settings, overcrowded settings. So we talk about adequate housing. We talk about, when we, when we talk about adequate housing, we are talking about the volume, the number of houses, talking about the size of houses, the number of occupants per room. We are talking about the ventilation adequate ventilation, cross ventilation, you know, in the, in the, in the houses where these uh, people are living. We are talking about um, other risk factors she mentioned, talking about smoking, cigarettes, talking about um, consumption of alcohol, you know, and then, um, um, then poor head seeking behavior. If these prevention, preventive measures are deployed and individuals come down with uh, signs and symptoms of, not just tuberculosis, but any condition, they should develop the habit of seeking expert care early. Because while these symptoms, most of the symptoms I mentioned there, uh, are easy to detect, they, they are largely, um, um, largely resolved from uh, pulmonary tuberculosis. They can be extra pulmonary tuberculosis that may not present with any of these classical symptoms, which will be detected only uh, with an expert uh, eye. Okay. So, uh, to have, we have spoken to your question quite elaborately, and I hope Hello? you're going to Hello, good morning. Hello, good morning. Morning to you. Yes, my name is Jude Ferry. I'm calling from Bakume, Wehi. Thank you, Jude, for joining us on Perspectives. Yes, thank you, Nathan. I, I have a question. Yes. Uh, do we have silent TB? And another question is, is there any uh, similarity symptoms 
between CB and Azman. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Jude. Thank you. We appreciate you. Let's take some messages. We'll come back and uh, try to also respond to that question by Jude, too. But before messages, some calls coming into. Hello, good morning. Good morning. Morning to you. My name is Jaro. Calling from high level. All right, good to have you on the program, Mr. Jairo Sotomola. Thank you, sir. I greet you to all your guests. Thank you. Thank this you. special place to all that discussion. They have done well. Thank you. God will bless you, your family. Increase their knowledge. Amen. 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 Uh, my, my own is a special appeal to, to the world between us. Not the only government, individual, cooperative organization, cooperative organization. Please help the society, help the less privileged ones, those who cannot afford to treat this TB, those who cannot even afford to even go for the test, those who don't even know that uh, there, is a, there is a test for it. Oh, they have it. I remember some years back, uh, the Moses Gantiman, late now, he went to a particular hospital and dropped some certain amount of money that whoever has a TB should go to that hospital. A lot of people benefited from it. So I want to beg our way to be in a society like uh, Agate Radio is doing. Because this program we are listening today. I don't think it's being sponsored by anybody. Not at all, sir. Thank you. So I get now, and I play their own part. Thank by you, sir. By bringing this matter on air, and a lot of people are questioning, asking questions, getting aware, and look at the professionals are breaking it to as if they are giving us water to drink. So please, I want to beg, go to any hospital, our way to do society, with philanthropies, companies, and so on, organizations, NGOs, Go to any hospital, drop money there, go and announce. Let people go there and carry out their test, carry their treatment. You are helping the government at the same time, you are helping the society and the less privileged one. That's my appeal. Thank, thank you. Thank you. God very, bless everybody. God bless you too, Mr. Jairus Otomola. Thank you very much for your kind words about our Gate Radio. We are really encouraged to continue to do more. That is why we are the voice of the people and we are providing the platform for the people. Hello, good morning. Good morning, sir. Morning to you. I am Andachi Gabriel from Odessa, my doctor. Thank you, Mr. Andachi Gabriel, for joining us from Perspectives. Thank you. I saw Jack by my doctor this morning. Am I feeling fine? And Otukbo, by extension, is peaceful too, we yes, suppose. I'm feeling fine. All right, that's good. It's a question of uh, what that <laughs> a, solution, <laughs> a solution wake up, people. <laughs> All right, let's uh, speak okay. to us on that. Too. My regards to our guests in the house there. Thank uh, you. Thank I thank Agate Radio like the, the last you can say. I say, in fact, if you are doing this, it's only God that you will reward you. No other person on net. Even when whatever salary you take there, you will not be enough. It's only God that is going to award the Agate Radio staff members. Amen. The work you are saying, this disease, it's not a simple thing for ordinary man. And this is the things they have discovered. What I want the first the government to do is to recruit more special personnel concerning this uh, uh, department of uh, TB. Let them set a department, concentrate on it, like other diseases also in the hospitals. Let them concentrate on it after training the personnel that uh, they can inform, like the Aggit is doing now, inform the people, uh, most especially the rural areas. They don't they feel no concern about it at all. Whenever they wake up, whatever they are trying to do, is just to look at the and they rejoice. But when it can affect anybody, just when they sit with him, with that person that is affected, they don't know, not knowing that uh, he's affected at all. And when this person cough, the air is polluted. And everybody is also polluted there. So awareness campaign like Agate is doing now. I want everybody, not only Agate, not only government personnel, 
but it's a concern for everybody in our society that uh, our society can be better. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Understood Gabriel. Thank you. Thank you for your kind words, too. We are encouraged. Okay, let's take some messages, which are mostly questions. Then we'll come back and respond to them and others that we have asked, we have been asked by those who called in. This one says, I am Abite Teso, a 300-level student of Department of Botany, Joseph Sawa Taka University, Makuri. I have three questions to ask. One, did the government assist and give people affected with tuberculosis drugs as subsidized rates and provide awareness for prevention from people who are not affected with the disease? Two, how would you know that you are affected with tuberculosis? Three, what are the prevention measures of tuberculosis? Okay, Abite, thank you for your message. We'll respond to the questions very shortly. This one says, good morning, Mr. Presenter and the doctors in the studio. My name is Otega Christopher Kate from NACA. My question is, can TB be transmitted through bodily fluids and sweat, as in the case of corpus, or through food we eat? Okay, thank you, Kate. We'll also respond to your question shortly, too. This one says, tuberculosis is contagious. A tubercular infection in which swelling mm. appear on the lungs and other parts of the body. Perhaps it would be better to make the disease as mild form by the medic when they inoculate the infected as a precautionary measure to avoid the peri. Good morning. Thanks to you in the studio. Isaac Utsua from Iye in Goma. Okay, Isaac, thank you for your contribution. We appreciate you. One more call, then we'll come back and respond to this question. Hello, good morning. Good morning. Hello. Good morning. Good morning, everyone in the studio. Morning to you. Welcome to Perspectives. Oh, thank you very much. My name is Kizito Otile. I'm calling from Coca-Cola, Makodi, Benue State. <clears throat> thank you, Kizito Otile, for joining us. All right. Thank you very much, Nathaniel. Um, you guys are discussing a very serious issue, and uh, it's very, very important. In fact, the callers are calling in and commending you. I'm also... I also align myself with them. You are doing a very great job, Nathaniel. God bless our get ready. Amen. Thank you. Is yeah, you see, um, talking about uh, tuberculosis, you know, it's a very serious and dangerous, deadly disease, but which one cannot even uh, wish to one's greatest enemy because it's not easy. You know, myself talking to you, I was a victim. I think I was about a year or two. Um, what happened was that I was watching a football match one day, so I saw a quote on the screen during their timeout that if you are, if you are coughing for more than two weeks or more, um, you should die. Hello? Yes, we are with you, Kizito. Okay, thank you. That you should die uh, three, three, four zero and then you follow the prompt so back home now i was actually coughing for more than three weeks i was really disturbed i couldn't sleep well sweating heavily in the night my body was very weak i was always always feeling very very weak i was coughing you know when i spit out very colorful greenish color you know like that so when i got the information very quickly I died. So from there, they will direct you to the six geopolitical zones. And then you follow up until you get to your closest center. You know, the guests in the house there have already said it. So from there, I rushed to, to North Bank uh, General Hospital. And then from there, they placed me on the treatment program, which lasted for about, I think, six months or so. Um, they gave me the drugs. Uh, the first thing they asked me to go and, bring, uh, to go and cough into a container, uh, you know, to bring the, 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 is this specimen? Yes. I think so. Yes, that's what it's called. Exactly. So I brought it. So from there, they run it through their processes, and then after the result came out, they said, okay, I have, this is what I have, tuberculosis. I said, what? What, how come? 
Ah, so okay. Although they never been like that of their instructions. When I came back, they run the test again. Period of time and then come back again. That is how. But it, and then they asked me to climb on the weight so that they would check the weight again to see everything was improving. Then at the end of the day, what would be the glory? When I went, they checked the follow up and then they told me, Oh, congratulations, now everything is over. I said, But the drugs is still at home. So what, what, what would become of that? They say, no, no need of taking it again. The, the result is now negative. And I said, then, what they were saying is that, that is, I later listened to a radio program just like the one you are doing right now. And then the guest was saying that, uh, then, the cost of treating tuberculosis is around 800,000 Naira. I said, oh, I should have been dead by now. Where will I get that kind of money? It's quite huge. And now that inflation is everywhere, I'm very sure if it is not 2 million, it should be above. So I am encouraging, just like uh, the doctors were saying in the house there, that we have poor uh, seeking, seeking medical seeking. Uh -huh. You understand? Yes. So it's always good for us to be checking our bodies. We shouldn't be ashamed of all those things. This is a very serious program that we should not take it on granted. In fact, Nathaniel, thank you very much. God thank will continue to bless you for Amen. me. Amen. Thank you very much. God bless you, too, Kizito. Thank you very much. We sincerely appreciate it. It's quite courageous of you to share this experience with us when people we hide away such history. You have come. It's more of a testimony and also sharing your experience so that people can learn from it. We appreciate you for not feeling any form of uh, one we feel stigmatized. That, oh, so, and so We appreciate you. Thank you so much. For sharing that with us, let's uh, respond to some of these concerns we have asked. Uh, we have been asked by those listening to us. First was from Jude Upebe, who asked us, "Is there anything like silent TB, and whether the uh, the uh, symptoms are similar with asthma?" Let me ask you, Doctor Agada, to speak to this uh, briefly, and then we'll also take more questions we have pending from our messages. Okay, and uh, thank you for the question. The silent TB is what he has been talking about, the light, latent. latent TB. Okay. Because it's been documented that half of the world population is exposed, has been at one time or the other been exposed to the bacteria causing the disease. So you can have it in you, like he has been emphasizing. You have the infection. It's, the bacteria is in one system, but it will not manifest until certain condition happens to you. That is when you are malnourished. That's your immunosuppressed. You have one condition or the other that will reduce your body, your own immunity. So that's when it will now come into the active TV that will start presenting with the various clinical signs. Then there are some organs that if it is affecting such organ, the signs may not manifest immediately until it has reached an advanced stage. Like if one a human has TB that affects the GI. Do you understand? Yes. Except if the tubercles become very large to the extent of blocking the intestine, it may not start manifesting. Do you understand? If it does not obstruct the passage of... Uh, digested food items or food items consumed, you may not, the individual having such infection may not uh, be able to, um, they may not be able to know that they have it. So until there's an obstruction of the, uh, the intestine and it's preventing the passage of digested food or the rest that, the symptoms will start manifesting. And most times when the such individual is taken to the hospital, they may not even start suspecting they may start suspecting other infections. Some may even suspect cancer 
until a laparotomy is conducted and they are able to excise the tobacco and take the, it to the lab for culture. That's something we'll be able to know that it is TB. At times, some may present symptoms similar to asthma, but not that similar. Maybe the medical colleague can uh, answer expand that. on that. Yes. Okay, Dr. Anza. But very quickly, let me engage with this caller. Hello, good morning. Hello, good morning. Morning to you. To have you on the program, Emeka Nyogo. Yes. Uh, my is that uh, I thank the doctor there first that they are giving the treatment. And I'm looking at it that uh, at this particular time, like when they were talking about Nunu, Nunu sometimes, like some cows may be having those type of tuberculosis, and when they bring it out, make sure that those things are, uh, that they identify. Uh, uh, Nunu is having that issue. So I'm of the involved involve NAFDAC in some of these things before people consume. Secondly, again, we should not be waiting on the of uh, TB uh, before people will start publicizing or telling people about the uh, harmness of the TB. So I am of the opinion that the government also should make it mandatory that every community should have these time criers that will be telling people the causes of TB and how you can get TB. And this one will eradicate most of these problems within the uh, communities. Because in the rural areas, you will see so many people sleeping together. They may not know whether this person is having TB or not. But okay. I believe that at this our health centers, if they can do this issue of telling them at the community level by using these time criers, I think it will help us. And also, I believe that the government should make these medicines or drugs available to those. And making it available, let it not be that they will be selling it at exorbitant price. They should make it that so that people will have it. And I'm using this opportunity to say that even uh, NGOs and other people should collaborate so that we can make sure that these things are being eradicated from our society. All right. Thank, thank you. you very much. God bless uh, I get very good. God bless you too, Mekanyogo. Thank you very much for your contribution. Okay, Dr. Anza, uh, very quickly, let's go to the question by Judo Perry. The, the symptoms, are there similarities in symptoms between uh, bicolosis and asthma? As he asked us if uh, people well, go well, back to um, questions here. Just like she said, if if the tuberculosis is pulmonary, if it's pulmonary tuberculosis, there are a few signs as a few symptoms because you are dealing with the respiratory tract. Basically, um, when you have when somebody presents with um, somebody who is an asthmatic presents with uh, symptoms, those symptoms result from the overreaction of the um, the airways, overreaction of the airways to irritants in the environment you know we know we talk about triggers that the people who have asthma you know may be exposed to that trigger those symptoms it is the respiratory tract overreacting to some of these uh, unpleasant triggers that may be um, specific to the individual patient who's presenting with their uh, symptoms of asthma respiratory tract can exaggerate yes it can exaggerate the symptoms of asthma but the symptoms are not uh, the same because the person will be coughing, have difficulty in breathing, which are which any other condition in the respiratory tract can cause. But by the time you get down to trying to dif differentiate between them, there are differences. All right. So the, the Judo Pevi, I hope we have answered your question quite sufficiently. Christopher Kati uh, from Naka had asked us, uh, can TB be transmitted through bodily fluid and sweat, as in the case of couples, through the food we eat? Uh, speak to that, Dr. Anza. Well, we talk of food we eat. If the food is contaminated, we talk about beef and other uh, animal, uh, other sources of uh, an animal food. We can be we can be gotten through that. But if we talk about uh, body fluids, um, maybe we are talking about blood now, or sweat. No, not uh, not commonly. I've not I've not read any literature that talks about tuberculosis uh, transmission through um, sweat. But in medicine, we don't say uh, never. We don't say this is impossible. Yes. Because we talk on the basis of the, author uh, on the authority of the knowledge that we have at a particular time. Science, the body of scientific knowledge is evolving. Yes. So at the moment, um, the, the transmission is known to be is an airborne disease. Transmission is, is largely through these methods that we have mentioned. And then consumption of 
meat that is infected, food that is infected with um, the bacterium. Body fluids like blood, sweat, even sex, sexual fluids uh, may, may not be impossible, but they are not the commonest routes of transmission. Okay. So, Kati, I hope we have also responded to your question. Then let's go to Teso Abite, uh, 300 level student, Department of Botany. He asked us three questions, which uh, I request you to speak to Sam. One, he said, did the government assist and give people affected with tuberculosis drugs at subsidized rates and provide awareness of prevention from people who are who are not affected with the disease let's uh, have you respond to that you have been involved in the health sector and also a government facility so at least you should have some uh, insight whether the drugs are provided at subsidized rates well yes TB we cases. have um, we have a couple of we have a couple of our listeners talking some of them advocating for government to subsidize this is the, the 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 point to emphasize is that treatment for tuberculosis everywhere within the Nigerian Federation in public hospitals is free of charge from the point of investigation to diagnosis and treatment. We, we it's hope free it, is, of it is, is not really free like bail is free in the Nigerian <laughs> Nigeria police. Oh, well, uh, I cannot speak for the Nigerian police, but I can speak for That's the the light that note. Yes, It's free of charge. <laughs> okay. Yes. Nobody is, uh, is charged anything. And if people, if there are facilities where people are, maybe there are illegal uh, charges that people are hiding to bring up, those facilities, I believe they will be, there's a, a way to report them to, because we have the National Tuberculosis um, and Leprosy Control Program. We have it at the state level. You know, we have um, a, a, a somebody in charge of that, heading that uh, arm of that program at the Ministry of Health. And we have it at the local government, um, um, uh, you know, uh, areas, the general hospitals. So it's, a, it's a, a program that is there on the ground and available. Just that awareness of it is, uh, which is an area where we may need to continue to emphasize. But in terms of as availability and accessibility, it is at no cost, no direct cost to the uh, patient. Okay, uh, so part of that question, he still asks us, is there an awareness provided for prevention that is for those who are not affected with the disease? In, uh, for instance, caregivers. What well, kind of awareness the caregivers of those who are affected with TB need to have in caring for such persons? They should, um, they should um, wear face masks. They should wear face masks. They should, uh, these individuals, if they are being kept at home, should be kept in well-ventilated spaces. Uh, the caller that talked about uh, his, his father's um, experience talked about somebody sweeping the floor, raising dust. These are practices that should be avoided in such places. The individual who is the patient should be taught hand and um, cough hygiene. And they also should have their own face masks, cover their face masks. And they, they should avoid indiscriminate spitting of sputum. When they produce sputum, should put it in the container and cover. Should avoid indiscriminate spitting of uh, sputum. But then, um, most importantly, the patient and the caregiver should both seek care timely. Okay. So the last two aspects of the question are that how would you know that you are affected with tuberculosis? Maybe the symptoms. Uh, speak about that briefly. Uh, just a refresher for him. We have spoken about that earlier, but if you may refresh, that will be fine. What are the prevention measures of tuberculosis, all wrapped in one? Uh, speak. The symptoms we have mentioned earlier include cough, chronic cough, cough lasting, any cough lasting longer than two weeks, weight loss, unintentional weight loss, drenching night sweat. Um, that cough may have, um, maybe stained, the sputum may be blood stained. Then um, these are the specific symptoms of um, pulmonary tuberculosis, specific symptoms. There may be additional symptoms that will depend on the site, the other site where the infection is present. And when you talk about control or prevention, we said um, people should practice um, good, should just have good head seeking behavior because some of the symptoms may not be classical. So if you are staying at home waiting to diagnose yourself before you come to the hospital, it may be late. All right. So I hope at BT we have tried to respond to some of your posers. Hello, good morning. Oh, uh, please, Nathaniel, I'm sorry, this is Kizito calling back again. I'll just be brief. Oh, please. Uh, yeah, uh, somebody asked a question, you know, others are making suggestion that is it uh, subsidized or that's the medication. 
uh, or they should subsidize it. You know, I told you practically, I did not pay a dime while on treatment, beginning from wherever uh, investigation, diagnosis, and then the treatment. I never pay a dime. One night I did not pay. It was absolutely free. And then on my own side, I feel completely negative right now. You know, I'm a footballer. Now I've gone back to the beach. I can play the football the way I want. I can do everything. I am absolutely neutral. Oh, wow. I speak with you. That's, Thank that's, you very much. That's interesting. Thank you very much, Kizito. Thank you. I think uh, we should make Kizito an ambassador <laughs> too. <laughs> if yeah. the authorities are listening yeah. to us, Kizito will be a good ambassador, especially that he's involved in physical exercises. Another message here, is one from our WhatsApp box says, Good morning, I get radio. I am Benedicta Tefa from High Level Makubi. Thank you so much for this awareness. God bless. Okay, God bless too. My, so my question is, please, without the noticeable symptoms, how can one know that they are having TB and report early? Dr. Anza, let's respond to this concern by Benedicta very briefly. Well, without noticeable symptoms, it may be difficult to, to detect, but um, individuals who have the practice of seeking health care uh, stand a higher chance of uh, whatever conditions they have been detected much earlier than those who don't. Yes. When you come to a hospital for any other condition, the doctor that sees you reviews your, your entire body systems. They ask you questions in specific parts of your body, and some of these questions may unearth sub two signs or sub two symptoms that are there that you because they have not been interfering significantly with your course of life you didn't even notice that were there or you didn't notice that there were things to worry about so this interaction interface between you and your doctor can unearth a lot of information that the doctor given his training and background we know that this some of these things you have unearthed are danger signs and then so, follow-up investigations can be done and then it can be detected much earlier so the individual who comes who seeks health care timely regardless of whether the, it's symptomatic or not, stands a higher chance of being de of the condition being detected earlier than those who don't seek health care. Okay. We are gradually uh, getting to draw our curtains on the program. Let me come to you now, Dr. Agada. You are of the Nigerian Veterinary Medical Association of the Benue State Chapter here. Is there any form of collaboration between the NVMA and the Nigerian Medical Association, for instance, to sensitize people more on TB awareness? We're working towards that because there's a one health uh, platform in Benue State where the veterinarians and the medics meet to interact on and find ways on preventing or tackling disease that are disease of public health importance. So this, uh, we have started, we had an awareness uh, webinar yesterday to, to create that awareness and sensitize ourselves. The veterinarians have come out today for their work to sensitize the bushes about the disease and the rest. And the medics are coming out tomorrow also to sensitize the public about the the disease. So it's a platform that we're starting and we're working towards it because we dis discover that some of the diseases, for it to be controlled and properly eradicated, needs the collaboration between the two sectors, the medics and the veterinarians. Because the veterinarians, when we control the disease or prevent the disease in, in animals, we're indirectly protecting humans from contracting the disease. So we're working towards that. And if there's one form of advice you should give to those operating at the abattoir and those who patronize them with regards to being conscious of TB uh, issues, what would that advice be? And this will be your parting words. Okay, my advice is that we should know that TB is real. Even though it is chronic, it might be silent, but one day it will manifest. So we should be careful with what we eat, the meat we eat. And those of us working in the abattoir, we should also know that in as much as we want to make gain, we also have to be conscious of the fact that what we do will affect humans. So we should strive to present and sell and give to the public meat that are 
safe and wholesome for human consumption. So the meat should be free of any infectious uh, disease. And also the humans that go to buy meat, they should check and make sure that they are buying safe meat because the disease is chronic. It may not manifest now. It may manifest later. We have to be careful. Uh, Dr. Anza, give us your parting words, particularly the UN General Assembly high-level meeting on TB had set out a target 2023 to 2027 to accelerate the progress towards ending TB. Is ending TB achievable? Well, the, um, the theme for this year's uh, World Tuberculosis Day is the answer to your question. Yes, we can end TB. Um, the direct, um, the details of how that, is, uh, that can be achieved are uh, what we are working out. And part of this radio program is part of uh, the uh, sustained awareness campaign that must continue to go on, not just on World Tuberculosis um, Day, but on every other day in the healthcare facilities, at the um, church, uh, church gatherings, uh, at the mosque gatherings, in um, communities, marketplaces, wherever two or three people are gathered at the community level, this awareness must continue. And then individuals must recognize that tuberculosis exists. It's not an academic topic. It's not there on the television or on the radio. It's right there in the community. It's right there in your neighborhood. This, as we are talking now, as I'm talking to you now, by the end of this program, 24 persons would have dropped dead from this disease. Five, one person dies every five minutes from tuberculosis. So it's, 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 not, it's, not, um, it's not a fairy tale. It's not, it's not a story. It's, it's real and it's, 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 it's living with us. It's, the people who have this disease are not people outside there. They are our colleagues at work. They are family members. They are church members. They are customers in the marketplace. They are our fellow footballers on the pitch. They are other human beings just like us. They may even be us, you know. So we should increase our, 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 our index of suspicion and develop a healthcare-seeking behavior. Let's not depend on the opinion of other people. Let's seek expert opinion on our health issues so that these conditions, which are preventable and curable, will be adequately addressed. So in that spirit, in the spirit of um, World um, Tuberculosis Day 2024, yes, we can end tuberculosis. And it's a collective task beginning with you and me. Thank you. I get radio is keen into that campaign slogan, yes, we can end TV. That's our program for today. There is now we discuss World Tuberculosis Day, which was marked yesterday as designated by the World Head Organization, and we focus on its awareness today. I must appreciate very sincerely our erudite discussions on the program. Associate Professor of Veterinary Public Health, Department of Veterinary Public Health and Preventive Medicine, she is also of the Nigerian Veterinary Medical Association, Benway State Chapter, Dr. Charity Agada. Thank you very much, Dr. Agada, for your valuable time and insights with us on the program. Thank you for having me. We also appreciate an epidemiologist. He is of the Department of Epidemiology and Community Health at the Benway State University Teaching Hospital, Dr. Msante Anza. Dr. Anza, always a pleasure having you on Perspectives. Thank you for your valuable insights. Thank you for inviting me, Nathaniel. Dear listener, we appreciate your listenership, contribution through phone calls and text messages. We couldn't take all the calls because the time was not uh, really enough for us. We hope you will be here with us and well, we hope you enjoyed the program. And if you did enjoy, why not join us again on Wednesday for another edition of Perspectives to focus on another issue. My name is Nathaniel Nongo. Do have a great weekend and stay safe. Remember, yes, we can end TB and stay safe to protect yourself from TB and your loved ones. God bless you and have a great week. Goodbye.